Good evening. Welcome to Melbourne Jewish Book Week. I'm Nicholas Brash, the director of Melbourne Jewish Book Week, and I'd like to start by respectfully acknowledging the Wurundjeri and Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation, who are the traditional owners of the land on which Melbourne Jewish Book Week is based. And I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and also acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners of lands across Australia, their elders, ancestors, cultures, and heritage. Tonight, we again partner with Jewish Quarterly to bring, you to, an, to bring you an interview with one of the international contributors to the latest issue. It is my pleasure to introduce you shortly to Sarah, to Sarah Abravea Stein. Sarah is Professor of History at UCLA and the recipient of many awards, including the Sammy Rao Prize for Jewish Literature, two National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowships, a Guggenheim Fellowship, two National Jewish Book Awards and the UCLA Distinguished Teaching Award. She is the author or editor of 10 books, including Wartime North Africa, a documentary history 1934 to 1950, which is the main subject of tonight's discussion, but also to be discussed is her review, The Sassoon Dynasty, Worldly Jews in a Globalized World that appears in the latest issue of Jewish Quarterly. Interviewing Sarah tonight, is David Slukey, the Associate Professor in Contemporary Jewish Life and Culture at the Australian Centre for Jewish Civilization at Monash University. Most recently, he has been the author of Sing This at My Funeral, a memoir of fathers and sons, and co-editor of Laughter After, Humour and the Holocaust. And without any further ado, I hand you over to David and Sarah. Thank you so much, Nick. And I also just want to acknowledge that I'm sitting here on Bunwarang country uh, and to pay my respect to elders past and present, just to acknowledge that uh, it is land that has never been ceded, sovereignty was never ceded, and I think that will be relevant to our discussion today, to be discussing uh, sort of Jewish mobility while sitting on unceded land. So, Sarah, thank you so much for chatting. Um, and I, you know, read your um, review of this fascinating sounding book on the Sassoons with great interest and your new upcoming book on wartime North Africa. So I hope we'll, you know, tie all the threads together. Um, but I want to start just with this because I think it's a really good intro into all this, this fascinating story about the Sassoon family. Can you tell us really briefly about the family, who they were and why their story, um, there's this multi-generational kind of family epic is so not only interesting, but important to understanding the modern Jewish world? Yes, it's my pleasure. And David, thanks so much for being in conversation and Nick for the, for the invitation to join your community. Um, so the, the review that we are discussing now is a review of Joseph Sassoon's book, The Global Merchants, uh, a history, a multi-generational, uh, more than century long history of the Sassoon family. And this is a family um, that were pioneers of an incredible um, global and mercantile uh, and also a familial diaspora, one that stretched from uh, Ottoman Mesopotamia in the 18th century across um, South Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, the British Commonwealth, England, beyond. And um, over the course of several centuries, they commanded um, incredible fortune, uh, vast investments. Um, they controlled pivotal um, supply chains that were crucial to the shaping of the modern uh, capitalist and consumerist world. And um, they were also um, Jews, Sephardic Jews. And their history is truly inextricable from the history of the modern British empire, the shaping of modern global capital, um, the shaping of um, uh, power imbalances that fueled and um, substantiated a commercial exchange across the globe and through the British Empire. And in addition to all of that, they are a family with um, fascinating figures through many generations. And in the book, uh, Joseph Sassoon, which a book that he worked on, I think for, for over a decade, 
Joseph Sassoon tells their story in an organic way, um, really for the first time. And, and in the review, I talk about various attempts to tell this story, including one that I um, uh, endeavored, but none have really embarked upon a study in as thorough a manner as Professor Sassoon has and to great, to great effect. So it's a, it's, a, it's a book that not only will interest David, people like you and me who work on family history, but people interested in global history in the British Empire, in um, uh, the Middle East and the Far East and, and all points in between. It's kind of the best of both worlds, isn't it? When you get not only this sort of story of global significance, but also a cast of really fascinating characters who whose personalities come out through the archives. It's absolutely true. And I think that it's their history and, and his version of their history are wonderful examples of what I know as a teacher and as a scholar to be true, but which is often really hard to illustrate, which is that Jewish history is also global history. And global history is, um, is made up of intimate histories that take place through families and in the lives of individuals. Um, even those not as lofty as the Sassoon's, but perhaps especially visible uh, in families such as this, and there weren't many like this, that were so significant to um, the course of the modern global um, system. So what is the, like to hone in on the Jewish aspect of this, what yeah. does the story of this family over the course of the century tell us about how the Jewish world changed from, you know, the the relatively humble origins um, in, in Baghdad to like a global empire? Um, well, their story is both exceptional and um, perhaps indicative of wider trends. One would be probably remiss to read it as a, um, a mirror to the, to the broader Jewish world, but there are ways in which they were influential in shaping that world. Um, the story that Professor Sassoon tells in The Global Merchants begins uh, in Ottoman Mesopotamia in the late 18th century and narrates um, the departure of, uh, from this region of a family patriarch um, who leaves in the midst of a kind of uh, power struggle uh, in which the Jewish community is implicated. And he and a son <clears throat> flee for, um, for first for Bushir, a coastal city in Iran, and from then they travel onward to Bombay. And um, what will happen in time is that the other sons will follow. They will form a kind of uh, commercial empire of their own. They will command incredible, um, what we might now call transnational contacts uh, fluency in many languages, uh, tremendous commercial savvy and dexterity, um, a kind of um, latter day Rolodex that connected them with merchants uh, in major trading ports around the world. Um, so this enabled extraordinary expansion into commercial empires um, of, of many kinds, uh, including the, tr the trade of cotton, of tea, of silk, and of opium, which of course then was, uh, a, was an, a legal commodity. And as many listeners will know, opium becomes a, a crucial um, commodity that both creates connections of trade um, and politics between um, East Asia and um, Britain, but also is the source of tremendous um, social distress and ultimately a, a, a political conflict um, resulting in war, resulting in, in all kinds of um, health problems and economic misery and, um, and ultimately being crucial in shaping um, unfair treaties between uh, Britain and global trading partners. Now, something that is in a way a side story for the Sassoons themselves, but a central story for Jews, is that this family is so important to commerce uh, across the Middle East and, um, and East Asia and South Asia that many, many Jewish families will follow in their wake through uh, a kind of chain migration, first with young men leaving, especially Baghdad and Basra and other 
uh, parts of Ottoman Mesopotamia um, to go and settle um, through South Asia and East Asia and follow them to Entrepo through these regions and represent the Sassoons. Um, and so it creates a diaspora. Their existence, their commercial prowess actually is generative of um, a, a Baghdadi, what we call it Baghdadi, but it's actually a bit more complex, but an Ottoman Jewish um, mercantile and cultural diaspora. And wherever these folks go, they are of course not only trading, they're also living lives um, as Jews and as women and men and, and children as part of larger communities. So it really, their, um, their power has this incredible um, ripple effect upon broad communities. And I should note that the you know that diaspora of Baghdadi Jews makes their way to Australia too, and Sydney absolutely has a not insubstantial group, um, sort of descended from those Baghdadi Jews. Absolutely so. And um, although Joseph Sassoon tells a story of um, of a, a fall from grace, from economic grace of the of much of the family, um, the family will continue to. Um, maintain properties in, in Hong Kong uh, and, and elsewhere, um, Shanghai, Bombay, Hong Kong, London, um, uh, in some cases to, to the present day. So your body of work really, um, you know, since your first book has dealt with, um, you know, these Jews from Middle East and North Africa, and your new book is another, po points to another development there. Um, but nonetheless, I would say that, like, overall, the field of Jewish studies is still slow to catch up to tell stories like that, like the Sassoons. Like, I would say that, you know, we're much more familiar with, say, the other Jewish commercial global dynasty, the Rothschilds, of course, um, than the Sassoons. So, I mean, why do you suppose that's the case, that we're still, you know, this, we're only now getting this, you know, path-breaking volume that you've edited on wartime North Africa that's World War II era world uh um World War II era North Africa when clearly like that's a crucial part of the story right well there are reasons of demography um and tradition that come to play here and also I think if we are to be frank reasons of prejudice um, the question of demography first, um, when it comes to the, very broadly speaking, the history of modern Jewry, there are manifold more Jews from the Ashkenazi European Jewish realm than there are from the Me Middle Eastern or Mediterranean worlds. If we look back to an earlier period of history, the numbers are reversed and um, the centers of um, the demographic centers of the Jewish world are indeed in uh, the Muslim Middle East. But for the modern period, we do have many millions more Ashkenazi Jews than Sephardi or Mizrahi or Maghrebi and the list could go on, Jews. So numbers help, help us understand why European uh, Jewish history has taken pride of place, I suppose, in the Jewish historical canon. However, numbers really aren't a full explanation or justification. Um, if they were, we would know a lot more about women's history than we do, needless to say, and Jewish women's history as well as non-Jewish women's history. So um, it, ex it partly explains the overwhelming attention that has been paid to European Jewry and to Ashkenazi descendants the world over. Um, but I think in addition to the question of numbers, we also have the question of um, um, a kind of repetition of tradition where um, mentors teach students who, who write books often in, in the uh, spirit in which they were trained and we then reproduce the wheel. Um, and, and I think the invocation of women's history is really fair here because it, it has taken a long time for women's history to become enfranchised as a field, to grow as a field, to produce new generations of wonderful scholarship, but even more crucially, to be taught in a kind of mainstream way to really affect the, um, what we might call the master narrative. And in Jewish history, we have a parallel. 
there has been a lot of wonderful work for some time on the Mediterranean and on the Middle East um, and on their de the diasporic communities they spawned. Um, but although this work exists, although I am blessedly part of a wonderful cohort of scholars, I would say that um, the larger field of Jewish studies, if you think of textbooks, if you think of syllabi, if you think of um, perhaps what, get, what work gets picked up by a broader public, is a bit slow to change its habits. And we're, and we're watching this evolution happen. Um, so you're right, David, that, that through my career, I've been really interested in trying to um, piece together um, very far reaching histories that cross geography and time and communities, but also always to give these communities um, a human face and to kind of um, bring broad global or imperial or transnational histories down to a human scale. And that is one of the principal goals of, um, of wartime North Africa is to bring um, a broad complex history to a human level. What do you think was the most remarkable? I guess they're all remarkable, but do you have like a favorite document? <laughs> and by favorite, it's, I don't mean that in a macabre way, but you know, is there a document that you just think, wow, like this tells us something we would never have known before? Yeah, it's, a, it's well, it is incredibly hard to choose, but, um, and this is one of the first book conversations I'm having because the book was just released weeks ago. So oh. I, I have to admit, you're, you're catching me. The question seems like I should have a pat answer, but it's actually quite fresh for me. I think that, that a, a few of the most arresting um, entries for me, and, and I should pause to say that this book is a documentary history um, that brings um, original sources from uh, roughly a dozen languages into English um, to narrate many perspectives on the unfolding of the Second World War in North Africa across uh, Morocco, Tunisia, um, Algeria, Libya, and into West Africa. Um, some of the material that interested me perhaps the most were very early documents before there was um, there were military uh, fascist military incursions into North Africa. North Africans, Jews and Muslims were closely watching events in Europe. Now this should be completely obvious to us. Uh, we should expect this, but I think the expectation is that the bulk of sources would be about how these people became victims of occupying regimes. The Vichy French regime, which was a collaborationist regime, the Nazi regime, which directly occupied Tunisia for nine months and the Italian fascist regime. But if we start to look as early as the early 1930s, um, well before the so-called final solution is adopted, um, before the Second World War is even declared, we can already see um, Jews and Muslims narrating, watching these events unfold, watching the rise of Hitler, watching the shaping of um, fascist Italy uh, under M Mussolini. And so I think in some ways it is those sources that open the book that, um, that remind us of the incredible um, uh, involvement that North Africans had with global politics and the um, acuity with which they were watching um, events in Europe unfold and also a kind of um, wisdom that what would happen with these still um, evolving, still nascent fascist empires would inevitably come to haunt North Africa. I mean, they couldn't have predicted all the details, but um, but they they had the foresight um, and the the kind of agency as writers and as political commentators um, to to talk about that. So one of one of the pieces that we open with, for example, um, I have the book in front of me is um, let's see if I can quickly find it is um, about a um, uh, a Moroccan man writing in. Um, in his hometown of Eswira, Morocco. His name is Isaac Knafo. Um, and he studied in Paris, came back to Morocco. He's the son of, of a prominent rabbi in his community. Um, he is a writer. 
And quite early, um, 1939, he writes a series of poems called Les Lesites Lyriques. Um, it's just after Germany has occupied Poland, the war has really only begun. And he writes a, um, we call it a sort of phantasmagorical poem. The language is um, crude and violent and vivid and um, um, sometimes scatological. And um, his, his emotions are so close to the surface. And he writes this explosive collection of poems demonizing um, Hitler and the ascendant Nazi regime. And then he panics. He publishes 2,000. He distributes them all through his town. He sells them for a modest sum. And he realizes how dangerous this is. And he goes about collecting and burning every copy he can find. And remarkably, um, there is only one remaining copy that we know existed, which um, was found in, in the private collection of a friend of this writer, Knafo, which um, made its way into print at the hands of um, uh, I believe the um, son of this friend who has now published have published it in full and we have published a translation. So that's an example of um, just the, the extraordinary sources that surface that um, defied my every expectation and hope. Hey, is it too forward to ask you to read us a, an excerpt from one of those poems? Um, <laughs> Give us a little well, taste of I it. I will try. Um, Okay, let's see. I will read. Um, I will read two stanzas from his poem, um, and you'll see that it is rich with metaphor. So I'm I'm pulling from the the middle of our selection. So again, the author is Isaac Knafo, born 1912, Asawira, Morocco, died 1979, and this is drawn from. Um, a poem that he published in pamphlet form called Les Ides Lerisque. <clears throat> so um, I will read a little bit to the reader. I have seen hatred flourish in the country of the Nazis and a whole nation endure the caustic corrosive acid thrown at them like a cruel joke by the speeches of an insane vulgar buffoon, this pernicious clown seized by fury preaching denunciation, murder, and violence. Despite my indifference, I felt my face flush and turn bright red from shame and disgust. In my feeble hands, the whip of satire is too clumsy to excoriate Hitler. At least it expresses my complete aversion. And that is why, reader, though I may displease you, in order to release my sorrow and to cry out my anger, I offer you this text filled with indignation. And the next stanza is called stanza is called the abortus. He's a degenerate, hindered by a clubbed foot with an angular profile, a skinny, sickly body, and the menacing look and furtive laugh of a sly criminal, scared but insatiable. Of the Aryan blonde, he has neither symptom nor trace. Trace. His progenitor botched him like a hasty job, and it is this byproduct of a fleeting love who calls himself the ideal regenerator of the race. He bears the imprint of the disdainful contempt in which he was held as prodigal nature crafted him, roughing him to be uglier than his caricature. And this is why, incensed like an aggressive yappy dog with each breath, he barks out vile resentment to spread hatred to the four corners of the earth. Wow, it's so powerful. It's, it's powerful stuff. And um, I think, you know, in Europe, Jewish writers were, of course, hamstrung in terms of their ability to write um, in this moment, 1939, the, the anger, the vitriol, the fear, uh, the fury that we know that they felt. Mm. Um, and even internationally, I would say beyond North Africa, it is rare to find writing this um, honest and fearless, although in the end, Kanafo was fearful and, and burned the product of his, um, of his pen. Mm. It's, I mean, this, the story of finding the sources is really incredible. And I think that's something also that, you know, I'm certainly thinking of your work on 
um, you know, family letters and, you know, the, the Sassoon book, like one of the big innovations you've written in your review is like it brings together all these sources that weren't available before. And, you know, the wartime North Africa book just gives us access to these sources. What do you think are the most complicated things as a historian in trying to piece together these, you know, sources that you find, you know, someone's friend has it in a private collection or in a garage in a box. Um, you know, this has 12 different languages. The Sassoon story must have the same number, maybe more languages. You know, how do Absolutely. we tell a coherent story when it's so, contains so much diversity, um, both culturally, linguistically, geographically? Well, this is um, an ever vexing, but also exciting question or set of questions that we face as historians doing the work of um, literary detectives, let's say. Um, the Sassoon family, of course, was um, astonishingly multilingual. Um, and Joseph Sassoon in um, writing this book was one of the first um, to to use an archive of the family that is now held by uh, the Hebrew University, um, which is a repository of thousands of documents dating from the mid 19th century to the mid 20th century, um, much of which is written in uh, Baghdadi Jewish dialect, um, some of which, which I have not seen, some of which I understand is also written in code, um, but they were multilingual and their documents were multilingual. Um, and so imagine the challenge of um, of trying to understand these texts. I would say when we think more broadly about the Middle Eastern and Mediterranean Jewish world, um, one of the challenges that we face is that these papers have not been systematically collected. Now there's a lot of materials in Jewish families of European origin that are in private hands. We can be sure of that, but on the other hand, there are a lot of libraries and archives that have been collecting those documents for um, generations. And it's really until only the last um, 15, maybe 20 years that we find that archives in, in Israel, in the United States, in France um, and beyond are making a concerted effort to gather the archives of um, the Middle Eastern Mediterranean Jewish world. So what this means in turn is that if you're interested in these histories, you have to do a tremendous amount of sleuthing. And um, the material is simply shockingly, it is all over. Um, you mentioned my book, Family Papers, which is um, tells the, the century long arc of a Sephardic family from uh, the city of Salonika, present day Thessaloniki, Greece, but once um, and for five centuries, um, an Ottoman city and a capital of the Jewish world. Um, and as I sought to reconstruct this sort of epic um, family history, um, I was not only reading documents in, um, or encountering documents, not all of which I could read in seven, eight languages that are also internally multilingual because that's how people spoke and wrote, but also looking in completely unexpected places. Um, and so I think to, to write any kind of history is to um, be innovative in, in where you look for documents and to be open to the complexity of documents. But to, to, to write this kind of history in particular that hasn't been collected, that comes from an extraordinarily multilingual part of the world is to um, uh, truly engage in um, rather Herculean efforts of um, document questing and interpretation. And it, it has brought me and uh, my collaborator, I should have said from the outset on wartime North Africa is my wonderful friend and colleague Omar Boom has brought both of us and we collaborated on an earlier book called The Holocaust and North Africa has brought us um, into living rooms, into private collections, into archives, um, the, truly the world over, um, not only across North Africa and across Europe, 
but in private hands in Mexico City, in Montreal, and I mean, just has taken us incredible places. And there were also oral histories that Omar himself collected in, in North Africa. So that's a meandering answer. But um, I think the point is that you've hit upon something fundamental, that to do this work is to um, open totally new doors and to find new material. One can't write it without that effort. Mm -hmm. And the wonderful thing is that that effort produces um, the data um, and the kind of living proof of remarkable histories. Mm -hmm. Both these stories, both the wartime North Africa and the Sassoon story, they're both, in my mind, clearly tied in with the history of European colonization, for better or worse, right? Whichever side the Jews are on um, within that sort of framework and that global system. Um, so I guess my question is like, what do these stories tell us about Jews' relationship to colonization, particularly? You know, do they have a, a kind of ambivalent relationship? Is there a sense of complicity? Um, how That's a, it's a great people? question. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it's something I've thought about actually through uh, my whole career. And I, I keep mentioning things I've written and I, I don't mean to be um, overly self-citational, but I, I also thought about this a lot with a book that I wrote about Jews involvement in the global ostrich feather trade, a book called Plumes, which was really caught up in the question of how Jews participated in um, a global economy that hinged on um, colonial um, authority. Um, so I think there's no single answer to your question, but as I understand it, and as I try to convey it as a teacher and in writing, I, I would offer this. I would say that Jews are on, um, Jews occupy all the niches that colonialism opens up. They are, some like the Sassoons are, um, are very, very cozy with colonial power and are benefiting from a colonial order that uh, is um, marked by great violence, great economic exploitation, um, the, um, the violent um, stripping of local resources, uh, natural and otherwise. Um, and of course, underpinned by racial prejudice and racial hierarchies, uh, which upon the top of which sit um, Europeans, white Europeans and, and men particularly. But that's just one piece. So we have some figures like Sassoon's, um, arguably the Rothschilds, arguably Moses Montefiore, the list goes on including people of less luminary stature, such as some of the folks that I looked into um, with the ostrich feather trade, they're actually working at a pretty low level. They're not, they're not moguls like these other names that I've mentioned, but they nonetheless are abetted by a colonial order. So we have Jews who benefit from the colonial order um, as economic actors, as um, government representatives, as philosophers of colonialism, political theorists, but we also have far greater number of Jews, and this has really been ignored in the scholarship until recently, far greater number of Jews who are subjects of colonial power, who themselves are um, uh, occupied by uh, uh, imperial forces um, through the Middle East, um, Latin America, um, South and East Asia, who are um, um, denied access to political rights, are witness to, um, you know, the um, disfoliation of land, the seizing of cultural treasures. Um, there are places like colonial Algeria, where most Jews are given preferential treatment relative to most Muslims. But even there, you have a Jewish population that is, um, Give, uh, put in the same legal niche as Muslims. So I think that we can paint um, a kind of spectrum here um, from the most powerful to the most powerless and um, Jews living with colonialism and under colonialism um, can be represented all across that spectrum mm. um, because they are modern humans and modern humans too, uh, you know, 
whatever their cultural or religious background um, occupy different different pieces of this order. Um, when it comes to World War II, and I'll just try to make this one brief because this is a this is a messy point, but one of the things that's very interesting about North Africa during the Second World War is that you have the intersection of fascist regimes with colonial history. So when the Italian fascists and the Vichy French and the Nazi um, occupiers in Tunisia um, impose race laws and impose um, uh, spoliation of property and, and goods and stuff like that um, and create camps, labor camps and prison camps all through the region. When they do this, in every place that they do this, it is interacting with colonial histories. And that will um, mean that fascism in North Africa takes slightly different form place to place and person by person and group by group um, as the war years unfold. Like where do Jews fit in the racial orders that emerge under fascism and Nazism in Vichy France? Um, in, sorry, well, specifically in North Africa. In North Africa. So um, when, when there is, after Germany occupies France, um, there is an agreement between um, this collaborationist um, uh, government based in the city of Vichy with um, General Pétain at its head and the Nazi leadership. And this government, the Vichy regime, we call it, um, now controls um, southern France, which is not directly occupied by the Nazis, and all of France's colonies. And all the legislation, all the racist legislation, and um, the economically um, violent legislation that the Vichy regime will impose in France also gets imposed in its colonies. Um, so one thing that's very important to make perfectly clear is that the bulk of Jews in North Africa are not deported to the death camps. And there was never a policy implemented such that that would be the case. However, the Vichy regime in its territories is imposing race laws, um, is engaging in theft, um, uh, and is um, uh, deporting mostly not local Jews, but deporting um, European Jewish and non-Jewish uh, refugees and um, other parties displaced by war, deporting them to very brutal camps um, across the Sahara and across the, the coastal cities um, of North Africa. You, and you can imagine in the book, we're trying to go into a lot of detail of the daily experience in yeah. camps in labor camps and um, as people um, find their businesses seized and um, they're kicked out of schools, kicked out of the professions. Th that's a lot of what we are interested in, in documenting, and, you know, in, in, on a human scale. I'm, I'm not sure if you can answer this then, but would you consider this a Holocaust story? That you're telling well, me. that is a really delicate question, and it's one that scholars of this field debate. Um, Omar Boom and I, my co-author and I, um, carefully title this book Wartime North Africa, because we do not believe that it is uh, historically um, sound to say that all North African Jews and or Muslims are um, uh, are subjects of the Holocaust. We, we think they are subjects of wartime fascist regimes. However, there are North African um, victims and survivors of the Holocaust because there are North Africans um, in Europe, especially in France, in Marseille and in Paris and elsewhere, um, who are either themselves immigrants or um, uh, the children of immigrants. And some of them are, are have been naturalized as French citizens, but that doesn't matter if you're an immigrant um, or the child of immigrant. There are many Jews uh, in this category. Well, I should quantify hundreds of Jews in this category who are deported to the death camps uh, as well as to internment and concentration camps and annihilated. But from North Africa, it is um, rare that Jews would be um, deported in the French zones. The Italians, um, 
did deport Libyan Jews to concentration camps in Italy. And some of those were then sent to um, the Nazi camps. So um, Omar Boom and I are, are very careful with our terminology. The first book that we published was a collection of analytical scholarly essays on this topic. And we called it the Holocaust and North Africa, not the Holocaust in North Africa, because we wanted to explore this interaction that I'm describing, how fascism seizes the region, some Jews from or in North Africa do become uh, Holocaust victims or survivors, but the bulk do not. Um, so one has to be really careful with the terms. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm really conscious of this in the context of a growing body of scholarship that's kind of expanding the borders of, whole, of what comprises the Holocaust and sort of thinking about scholars, for example, that look at the Jews who escaped Poland to the Soviet Union or Central Asia or um, Iran and Palestine and sort of, you know, or the, or, or the scholars who are writing about like German refugee, Jewish refugees who escaped before the war, where do they fit within this? You know, they're kind of on the margins of the story. Um, and I think it's something we as historians have to keep grappling with, like, where and why you draw these definitional boundaries and what purpose it serves. Um, I, I quite agree. And, and I think um, I think that um, historical precision is so important. And I also think um, we, we, while we want to be cautious, we also can't be inhibited from kind of opening the door to stories that have been ignored. Um, and the North African Jewish stories that we are uncovering do include, you know, resistors and um, uh, partisans and, um, you know, forced laborers and, and everything that one would find of European Jews. So while it, I would say it isn't fair terminology in general, in my opinion and informed <laughs> opinion, um, it, it doesn't mean it can't ever be applied. But I will say there are scholars who disagree and take um, and, and take a broader approach. Yeah, I mean, I guess like one of the difficult things with this is like everything gets kind of overwhelmed by the magnitude of Auschwitz um, and other death camps, but particularly this the symbolic importance of Auschwitz. And so, yeah, it gets much harder to tell those other stories of people who didn't suffer to the same degree, but lived under, you know, did suffer under Nazism or, or Stalinism. Um, I guess the, the last question I want to ask is one, you know, one of the things you point to in your review, and, and I think this is also something that kind of, you can maybe give us a sense within the book, um, is the role of the women in the Sassoon family uh, as part of that empire. Um, and, you know, in particular, there's a daughter-in-law who takes over a branch of the family, but in general, it seems overwhelmingly like a story of men um, and sort of patriarchy, um, you know, kind of reproducing itself. Um, like, how do we uncover those stories, particularly, as you said earlier, you know, like if we're telling the story of the majority of people or nearly the majority or whatever, you know, those are harder to find in the archives. So then how do you tell those stories? And, and it's clear that's been a, you know, big effort that you've gone to in the book as well to make sure you are uncovering the whole breadth of stories. Yeah, I do. I do appreciate that. I, in the review in, in Jewish Quarterly, I, I both compliment and am, am gently critical of Joseph Sassoon's treatment of um, the women and girls in the Sassoon family. He, he dwells um, at some length on a remarkable woman um, named uh, Farha Sassoon, um, who, was the, who was the daughter of a prominent um, Jewish family from Bombay and then marries uh, Suleiman, one of the um, grandsons, if I'm not mistaken, of the patriarch with whom um, Joseph Sassoon begins his story, and um, after her husband's death, she uh, assumes the mantle of, of the entire branch of Sassoon and Company in Bombay. Um, she's the mother of small children. Um, she, she displays great um, uh, commercial um, skill. 
Um, but ultimately there's a, a family schism perhaps because the men in the family are uneasy um, because of, of her growth and power and, and um, she retires. Um, my, my criticism of Joseph Sassoon was that for many other of the women and girls in the family, their presence is a bit shadowy. Um, and I think that's because his focus is so much on the commercial empire that was the Sassoons and these other arenas perhaps are less magnetic to him. Um, but to me and to Omar, as you, as you mentioned, we were really driven to seek out the stories of girls and of women and if not in their own voices, um, then narrated by others, but many, many, many in their own voices. Um, and to let their stories um, loom large, uh, stories of day-to-day -day experiences, stories of mothering, of coming of age under fascism or in, let's say the Italian fascist camps that were created um, that into which Libyan Jews were forcibly uh, placed, um, stories of sexual violence needed out by many, many parties, um, not only um, the Nazis in Tunisia, um, but also the American um, troops who come in the wake of Operation Torch. Um, but here's what I think is interesting about telling those histories. Um, I'm a great believer that you can't find material unless you look for it. <laughs> and that sounds very trite, but I think that, um, you know, one of the beauties of teaching is that my students will look for things that I didn't think to see. And I'm looking for things that, that my teachers perhaps didn't think to see. Um, and for Omar Boom and myself, we were very determined to to unearth these stories, to amplify these stories through photography as well as through text. And the more we looked, the more we found. And it turned out um, not to be the maxim that they hadn't written as much. Rather, the maxim proved to be that one had to look all the harder. Right, there's something kind of like, th there's almost a kind of racism that underpins that notion that they didn't write as much you know, that again reproduces itself and we just convince ourselves. And like you say, once you go looking for it, you find it's there. Uh, so I think that, you know, that that's probably a wonderful place to wrap it up. I, I can really strongly recommend um, Professor Stein's new book, Wartime North Africa. Um, and please check out, uh, I'm not sure, Nick, if you're going to do this, but I will say, check out the new edition of Jewish Quarterly with um, Sarah's essay on the, the global merchants, the enterprise and extravagance of the Sassoon dynasty. This was so much fun to chat with you, Sarah. Lovely to be in conversation, David. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Sarah, David, both of you for those for that fascinating discussion, the insights into the Sassoon family, and of course the 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 discussion about North Africa Africa during the war, I, I'm, I'm sure I'm not alone in having my knowledge greatly expanded throughout this conversation. But there's so much more I, I want to know, and I was uh, I was intrigued by also the um, the insights into the research process. Uh, um, in general, but, but both specifically about these pieces, but also in general, I think I think there's a lot a lot, a lot to think about there as well. Yes, um, a reminder, of course, Sarah's piece in the latest issue of Jewish Quarterly. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, please remember to keep an eye out for our newsletters for news of our latest events. We've got a few things coming up over the rest of the year. Go to our website and subscribe if you don't currently receive our newsletter. Um, and on that note, thanks again, Sarah and David, and thank you all for joining us this evening. Good night. Good night. Thank you.